July 16, 2011, Tyler Hadley had been planning a party, but his parents refused. But by 8.15 p.m., Tyler told everyone to come to his place because the party was on. But for that to happen, Tyler had to eliminate the obstacle, his parents. These are the most evil teens in the world. Number 12. TJ Lane February 27, 2012, TJ Lane opened fire inside a cafeteria at Chardon High School in Ohio, wearing a sweatshirt with the word killer on it. His goal was to kill someone he thought was a romantic rival. TJ, who was by all accounts a troubled kid, ended up killing three students and wounding three others. Thomas Michael Lane III wasn't raised in a happy home. His dad spent a lot of time in prison, mostly for hurting women, including his mom, while his mother also faced legal battles causing them to lose custody of Lane, which forced him to reside with his grandparents. TJ Lane was also deemed a reluctant learner, leading to his transfer to the Lake Academy, a school for students with special needs. After the shooting, those who knew him denied that Lane had been bullied. They described him as friendly and nice, but not very talkative. However, Lane had a hidden dark side. According to reports, two months before the shooting, he published a disturbing piece of writing on Facebook. I am death, and you have always been the son. Now, feel death, not just my you, not just stalking you, but inside of you. Die, all of you. And while it may have raised a few eyebrows, no one really predicted the tragedy that would happen next. February 27, 2012. At approximately 7.30 a.m., TJ stormed into the cafeteria, where many students gathered before their morning classes, and opened fire. After he felt he was done, he ran out of the cafeteria, only to be tackled by a teacher named Joseph Reese and a coach named Frank Hall. But by the time his rampage was over, three students lay dead, and two were severely injured. TJ Lane's trial went as expected. He was quickly tried and convicted of the crime, but it was his behavior in the courtroom that made headlines. At his sentencing hearing. Lane wore a white shirt with the word killer scrawled across it. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, to my left is uh, Nicholas Burling, Chauvet County Assistant Prosecutor. Mark he also stuck up his middle finger and addressed the victim's family, saying, Lane was convicted and sentenced to three life sentences without the chance of parole. He only avoided the death penalty because he was 17 at the time. September 11, 2014, TJ escaped the prison along with two other inmates. But less than 24 hours later, they caught him without much fanfare. Today, Lane serving the remainder of his many life sentences at a supermax prison in Ohio. Number 11, Daniel William Marsh. Every time I look at someone, I see flashes of images of me killing them in numerous ways. April 14, 2013, Oliver Thornup and his wife Claudia Maupin were brutally tortured and murdered in their home in Davis, California. The person responsible for this heinous act was none other than a 15-year-old named Daniel William Marsh. Now, really, we all think, how could someone so young commit such a terrible crime? Well, Marsh had a long history of being a troublemaker. He was always getting into fights and misbehaving, but it didn't stop there. Marsh actually fantasized about torturing and killing people and wanted to be a serial killer. So one fateful night after years of twisted thoughts, Marsh finally snapped. Feeling overwhelmed by the demons in his head, he decided to make his sick fantasies a reality. In the dead of night, he left his mom's house and started wandering the streets of Davis, looking for an easy target. And that's when he stumbled upon the home of Moppin and Northup. Marsh would cut open the window screen, enter the house, and quietly make his way up to the couple's bedroom. There he found the two peacefully asleep. Marsh watched him sleep for a few minutes and would stab both victims to death over 60 times. After killing these two Two poor people, his sick urge wasn't yet satisfied. He took his sweet time mutilating their bodies. The bodies of the couple were found the next day. However, it wasn't until June that Marsh was finally arrested. He'd meticulously planned these murders, leaving behind no trace of DNA, fingerprints, footprints, or any other evidence at that crime scene. But as fate would have it, his ego would ultimately be his downfall. He became a suspect after bragging to his friends about the murders. Marsh was then interrogated and confessed to the crimes. He was even excited to do so, telling them all the evidence they would need was 
was in his mother's garage. During that interrogation, Marsh stated, I don't feel sympathy for other people at all. He told investigators that the murders gave him a feeling of pure happiness, which lingered for weeks. And probably if he hadn't gotten arrested, he would have done it again and again. Actually, after Marsh made a full confession, the interrogator wanted to know the extent of his troubled mental state. So he asked him, You um, mentioned that pretty much everybody you meet, you have thoughts about killing them and how you would kill them. Yeah. So, how would you kill me? Marsh's answer was chilling, to say the least. Choking you to death with your tie, okay. uh, eating your face in the mirror until it broke, and using the glass to cut your arteries, uh, gouging your eyes out, and just smashing your face into the wall. September 2014, Marsh was convicted of the murders and was declared sane. His juvenile status made him ineligible for the death penalty and a life in prison without parole. But unfortunately, Marsh isn't the last teen on this list committing these heinous acts for fun. Number 10, Alyssa Bustamante. 2009, Alyssa appeared to be your typical rebellious teenager in rural St. Martin's, Missouri. However, her seemingly normal facade shattered when she cold-bloodedly murdered her neighbor, Elizabeth Olton. Alyssa was raised by her grandparents because her parents cared more about drugs and alcohol. Her mother had faced criminal charges and jail time, while her father was serving time for assault. Despite her challenging upbringing, Alyssa managed to excel academically, seeming like an ordinary kid, finding solace in her grandparents' loving home. Friends described her as someone who enjoyed writing poems and joking around. She also actively participated in church activities and engaged in various youth programs. But nobody knew that online, Alyssa was an entirely different person. Bustamante's Twitter feed talked about how she hated authority. She listed her hobbies on YouTube and MySpace as killing people. She also posted a YouTube video where she tried to get two of her brothers to touch an electrified fence. October 21st, 2009, Alyssa went on to turn her darkest fantasies into a horrifying reality. Living just four houses away from the Bustamante family was Elizabeth Bolton. Liz used to visit Alyssa and her siblings to play, and on that fateful night, Elizabeth's mom, Patricia Priest, recalls her daughter pleading to go over to Alyssa's house. That was the last time she would see her daughter alive, and her intuition was saying something was terribly wrong. The day after Liz's disappearance, FBI agents interrogated Alyssa and confiscated her diary. And as this investigation progressed, law enforcement made a chilling discovery. There was a shallow grave concealed beneath a layer of leaves right in the backyard of the Bustamante residence where Liz's body was buried. Alyssa was arrested and prosecutors charged her with first-degree murder, leaving everyone in a state of utter shock. But soon her diary exposed a chilling revelation about her true nature as authorities stumbled upon an entry that detailed the disturbing euphoria she experienced following the murder. I just fucking killed someone. I killed them and slit their throat and stabbed them and now they're dead. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the, oh my god, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. Okay, gotta go to church now. <laughs> LOL. January 2012, Alyssa confessed to killing Elizabeth and accepted a plea deal to the lesser charge of second degree murder to avoid the death penalty. As part of that plea deal, she may get out of jail in 30 years on parole. Number 9. Philip Chisholm October 22, 2013, at just 14, Philip killed his math teacher, Colleen Ritzer, at Danvers High School before dumping her corpse behind that school. Fall of 2013, Chisholm moved from Tennessee to Danvers, Massachusetts, where he wasn't well known at the school, apart from being a good soccer player. However, some reports described him as antisocial and out of it, possibly indicating that he was going through a difficult time. It was later revealed that his mother was going through this challenging divorce during this period. On the other hand, Colleen Ritzer was known for her positive and caring nature. She always went above and beyond to help her students, including Chisholm. In fact, just before the incident, Ritzer had complimented his drawing skills, offering to assist him in preparing for an upcoming test. Little did she know, Chisholm already had a sinister plan set in motion. Hours later, he committed the unthinkable. At the end of the school day, Chisholm followed Ritzer into a school toilet. Wielding a box cutter, Chisholm robbed 
sexually assaulted and killed her, and then rolled her body in a garbage can to the woods behind the school. Chisholm then took himself into town and bought a movie ticket using her credit card. He then left that theater and went to steal a knife from another store, possibly with another victim in mind. Fortunately, he never had the chance to carry out that plan. At 12.30 a.m., while walking alone on a dark highway outside Danvers, he was stopped by police during a routine safety check. During a frisk for ID, the police found Ritzer's credit card and driver's license in Chisholm's possession. They took him straight to the station, where they searched his backpack and discovered her purse and underwear, along with the box cutter cut covered in dried blood. When asked about the ownership of that box cutter, Chisholm casually replied, It's the girls. When questioned about her whereabouts, he chillingly stated, She's buried in the woods. At 3 a.m., the police found her mutilated body partially covered with leaves near a pair of stained white gloves. A handwritten note was found nearby reading, I hate you all. Philip Chisholm was indicted for murder, aggravated assault, and armed robbery. February 26, 2016, he was tried as an adult and sentenced to a minimum of 40 years in prison. It's crazy thinking teens are capable of doing these things, but to hurt your loved ones and family members, well that's another type of nightmare. Number 8. Sierra Halseth April 2021, Sierra Halseth and her boyfriend Aaron Guerrero burned and killed Sierra's father, Daniel Halseth, at his house in Las Vegas. Now, Sierra is the daughter of the former Republican state lawmaker, Elizabeth Halseth. Elizabeth and Daniel had a public battle as their relationship fell apart, and a custody battle over their kids followed. During their trial, the teenage couple claimed that Halseth had abused and mistreated his daughter, which they believe justified their decision to eliminate him. However, the Halseth family vehemently denied these allegations, stating that they were completely false. Now, a fact making these claims a little unbelievable was that Daniel and Sierra had stabbed him over 70 times and then put his body into a sleeping bag and tried to dismember it with a chainsaw and a circular saw before setting it on fire. The body was found in the garage of his home shortly after. But what was it that drove Sierra to kill her own father? Now, reports revealed that Daniel had recently told his daughter that he did didn't want her to date Guerrero. Apparently, the couple had discussed running away together, leading the parents to forbid them from seeing each other. In addition to having a motive, the two were caught on video buying tools, lighter fluid, and cleaning supplies prior to the murder. The couple quickly became the prime suspects, but they managed to evade capture by fleeing to Utah after brutally killing this man. But everyone eventually makes a mistake, and in their case, it was uploading a video to YouTube. Days after the murder, the video went around of both of them casually joking about the murder as if they were recording a vlog. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. After day three. Day three after murdering somebody. Whoa! Don't put that on the camera. And as you can imagine, they were arrested immediately. I mean, talk about incriminating evidence. Were they stupid or just bragging? Who knows? They both pleaded guilty to nine counts each, including murder with a deadly weapon and first-degree arson. October 20th, 2022. Sierra and Aaron both received a sentence of 22 years to life, and the next person on this list also killed her family along with her boyfriend. But the motive behind the crime will blow your mind. Number 7. Jasmine Richardson in April 2006, the Richardson family was killed, all except for Jasmine. Was she miraculously spared? No. She took him out along with her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steinke. Now, what could drive such a young girl to carry out such an unthinkable crime? Jasmine and Jeremy's paths crossed at a punk rock show. Before meeting this guy, she was known as a happy, outgoing girl. However, she was instantly captivated by that goth lifestyle. She became a member of this website, VampireFreaks.com and started wearing dark makeup to appear older than her tender age. But why did she feel the need to do all that, you ask? Well, it turns out that Steinke had developed a rather elaborate persona. He would wear a vial around his neck, claiming to be a 300-year-old werewolf. And when Jasmine's parents discovered that relationship, they understandably forbade her from seeing him. This decision left Jasmine furious and resentful towards her parents. April 3rd, 2006. Livid at Richardson's parents. 
parents. Steinke wrote on his blogging platform, Payment. Their throats I want to slit. Their blood shall be payment. However, according to reports, it was actually Jasmine who first came up with that sinister plan. In an email to Steinke, she stated, It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. April 23rd, 2006, at her parents' house, Jasmine and her boyfriend followed through with that monstrous act. The next day, a young boy went to his friend's house, who happened to be Jasmine's little brother. He thought he saw a body through the window and immediately ran back home to tell his mom, who wasted no time in calling the police. When the cops arrived, they found a massacre. Mark, Deborah, and their son had all been brutally murdered. Worried that Jasmine might also be a victim, the police quickly issued an Amber Alert. However, after finding incriminating evidence in her room and locker, they soon realized that she was the primary suspect. Jasmine and Jeremy were eventually found and apprehended in Steinke's truck. 2007, during that trial, Jasmine pleaded not guilty. She claimed that she only had engaged in a hypothetical conversation about killing her family and had never intended to follow through with it. Despite her plea, a jury found her guilty on all three counts of first-degree murder. As a minor, she received the max sentence of six years in jail, followed by four years of supervision in the community. 2008, Jeremy Steinke was also convicted of three counts of first-degree murder. He was given life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years years. Now, the next teen on this list wasn't much different than Jasmine. When her parents told her that she couldn't see her boyfriend anymore, she sought revenge by killing her family while they slept. Number 6. Aaron Caffey March 1st, 2008, two men would break into the Caffey home in Alba, Texas, taking out two little boys and their mom. The only survivors were 16-year-old Aaron Caffey and her father, Terry, who was also shot many times before they set the house on fire. The tragic fate of the Caffey family was set in motion five months before their deaths by Aaron herself, when she started dating Charlie Wilkinson. Their fate twisted when Aaron was working part-time as a waitress at a Sonic fast food restaurant. Their relationship grew pretty quickly, especially when Wilkinson gave her a promise ring, expressing his desire to marry her. However, when Aaron's academic performance began to decline, her concerned parents decided to check out this boyfriend. They turned to the internet, gathering more information about him, and they found Wilkinson's MySpace page, filled with these references to and discussions about alcohol and now that led him to forbid Aaron from continuing that relationship. Around the same time, Aaron started talking about her desire to kill her parents in front of her friends. She believed that this was the only way that she could be with Wilkinson. And so she came up with this sinister plan to carry out these intentions with the help of Wilkinson and his friend, Charles Wade. On the day of the murder, Wilkinson and Wade pulled up to the driveway of the cafe home. Outside, Aaron and Wade's girlfriend waited in the car. Before getting onto the property, Wilkinson told Caffey that he had to take out her younger brothers to ensure no witnesses remained. Her response? I don't care, just do what you gotta do. Once inside, Wilkinson made his way to Terry and Penny's room and heartlessly fired at the unsuspecting couple with a 22 pistol. The two then proceeded upstairs where the brothers were hiding and mercilessly ended their lives. After the gruesome act, the two ransacked the house before pouring lighter fluid on the furniture and setting it ablaze. Miraculously, Terry Caffey regained consciousness as the flames engulfed the house and managed to crawl out of a window. It took him an entire hour to reach the nearest neighbor's house, where he finally alerted the authorities. In less than 24 hours, all four were caught by police, and they were all talking, except for one, Aaron Caffey, who claimed she'd been kidnapped. However, that kidnapping tale quickly fell apart. Both Wilkinson and Wade corroborated the same story to the police. It was all her twisted idea. In the end, Caffey, Wilkinson, Wade, and Wade's girlfriend were charged with three counts of capital murder. Wilkinson and Wade received life sentences without the possibility of parole, and Caffey was also sentenced to life. However, she may be eligible for parole after 40 years. Number 5. Nehemiah Grigo January 19th, 2013. 15-year-old Nehemiah went to the church he and his family used to frequent. He aimlessly roamed around before approaching the pastor and telling him that his family had been killed. 
gunned down in their own home in New Mexico. Then, without an adult or lawyer present, Grigo agreed to talk to police, admitting that he was the one who killed everyone. He didn't give a reason, but he did tell the investigators that he was mad at his mom and had thoughts of ending his own life. As the investigation went on, they were able to piece together what happened. First, Grigo took some weapons from his parents' closet and used a 22 rifle to shoot his mom around midnight. Then, he woke up his brother, Zephaniah, and told him that he had shot their mom before shooting him with that same rifle. Rifle. After that, he went to his sister's bedroom where they were crying and he shot each of them in the head. Grigo then went downstairs to wait for his father to return home from his shift at a homeless shelter. When the father came home around 5 a.m., Grigo shot him multiple times with an AR-15 type semi-auto rifle. He then made the disturbing choice to send an email containing a picture of his deceased mother to his girlfriend before getting into his father's car. His initial plan was to drive away, commit more murders, and engage in a shootout with the police, ultimately ending his own life. However, something caused Grigo to have a change of heart. He decided to drive to the family's church and speak to the pastor. When the pastor asked him about his dad, Grigo said his whole family was dead. The pastor and another person from church, who used to be a detective, decided to take Grigo back to the house. But on the way, the retired detective knew something was wrong and called 911. Grigo admitted to the cops that he had been planning these killings for four days. October 2015, Grigo admitted to two counts of second-degree murder and three counts of child abuse that led to death. He was sentenced as an adult and given three concurrent life sentences with the possibility of parole after serving 30 years. Sadly, this next person also killed his entire family, and then he threw a party. Number 4. Tyler Hadley July 16, 2011, more than 60 people came to 17-year-old Tyler's house and partied for hours unaware that his parents' corpses were hidden just behind their bedroom door. Earlier in the day, Tyler had posted on Facebook inviting people to his place, writing, Party at my crib tonight, maybe. However, there was a major obstacle standing in his way. His parents were home, and since they had recently grounded him for his reckless behavior involving alcohol and drugs, they weren't about to let him throw a wild party. The punishment only fueled Tyler's anger. He confided in his best friend, Michael Mandel, expressing his desire to kill his parents. Michael dismissed it as a typical outburst, never imagining that Tyler would actually follow through with such a horrific plan. However, Tyler did have a plan, and on that warm July summer night, he set it into motion. First, he took his parents' phones. That way, they couldn't call for help. Then he would take some ecstasy around 5 p.m., worried that he couldn't go through the plan sober. Tyler would then grab a hammer from the garage, and while his mother sat at the computer, Tyler was staring at the back of her head for five minutes. Before he relentlessly swung, she turned and screamed, why? And now the father, who heard those screams, ran into the room. He would echo his wife's question, with Tyler shouting back, why the f not before beating his father to death. After killing his parents, Tyler dragged their bodies into their bedroom. He cleaned up the crime scene and invited his friends over for a party. By midnight, over 60 people were in attendance, completely unaware about the lifeless bodies in the next room. Later in the night, Hadley pulled his best friend Michael Mandel aside and dropped that bombshell. Mike, I killed my parents. Mandel initially thought it was some kind of twisted joke, but Hadley took him to the bedroom where he had hidden the bodies and reality sank in. Despite his shock, Mike didn't immediately leave the party. He decided to capture a selfie with Hadley, knowing it might be the last time he saw his friend. Afterward, Mandel left the party and dialed Crime Stoppers, reporting the gruesome murders. The police wasted no time and went straight to Hadley's residence. When they got there, the party was still in full swing, and Hadley stubbornly insisted that his parents were away and refused to allow the officers inside. But they made an emergency entrance, despite his protests, and discovered the bodies. Tyler Hadley was arrested for the murder of his parents. 2014, a judge gave him two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 3. James Fairweather March 29th, 2014, a local man stumbled upon a horrifying sight at Castle Park in Essex, United Kingdom. He would discover the lifeless body of a man lying in a pool of blood. The deceased man was identified as James Atfield, a local father of five. He'd been stabbed a total of 102 times, suffering injuries to the head, face, and torso. June 17th, just three months after James's murder, a woman was found dead at the Salary Brook Trails. She was ID 
ID'd as Nahid Almanea and had been slashed and stabbed 16 times, including once through both eyes. Nahid had come to the UK from Saudi Arabia to study English. At first, the detectives didn't think there was a connection between the two murders, so they started investigating whether Nahid was a victim of a hate crime. But as the investigation went on, the detectives said that they might be looking for possible links between the two murders. Unfortunately, they didn't have enough evidence to find a person responsible. However, a year later, something happened that would lead him to the true killer, who turned out to be a 15-year-old. May 27, 2015, a woman called the police, reporting a suspicious teenager hiding in the bushes while she was walking her dog. The police quickly arrived on the scene and searched the teen boy. They found a lock knife on him, and he was also wearing surgical gloves. The boy's name was James Fairweather. Later that evening, when Fairweather was brought in for questioning, he did confess to the murders of both James and Nahid. He stated that he had found James asleep on the ground and stabbed him repeatedly. There was a big pool of blood. I thought he was dead. He gurgled. As for Nahid, he said, I went behind her and hit her. She stumbled. I hit her in the eye and killed her instantly. It went through the brain. He also admitted that at the time of his arrest, he'd been actively looking for another victim. January 2016. Despite having already confessed, Fairweather pleaded not guilty to the murder charges. He opted to plead guilty to two alternative counts of manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility, hoping for a more lenient sentence. Unfortunately for him, his plea was rejected by the Crown Prosecution Service, who decided to pursue murder charges instead. During the trial, it was revealed that Fairweather was obsessed with serial killers and had researched those who had pled guilty to manslaughter by reason of diminished responsibility. Also in his confession, Fairweather claimed that he heard voices in his head, urging him to make a sacrifice. However, a psychologist called as a witness for the prosecution revealed that Fairweather's hallucination claims were actually just an attempt to deceive those evaluating him. Fairweather had also confessed to the doctors that he had plans to kill 15 more people, but luckily he was apprehended before he could carry out his sinister intentions. He even went as far as to say that if he were ever released on bail, he would kill again. April 2016, James was found guilty of both murders and was handed a 27-year prison sentence. Sadly, Fairweather isn't the only teen on this list who was considered a serial killer. Number 2. Harvey Robinson between 1992 and 93, 17-year-old Harvey Robinson attacked five women, killing three, and is currently the only person on death row to have committed his crimes as a juvenile. And like many juvenile offenders, Harvey's background seems tailor-made for his downfall. In school, he showed signs of severe conduct disorder, and teachers quickly noted his inability to tell right from wrong, with severe distaste for authority. And as he grew older, his threats and outbursts became more intense causing people to truly fear him. And so it came as no surprise when he was arrested for the first time when he was only nine. 1993, Robinson spotted his first victim, Joan Berghardt, undressing before bed through her apartment window. After a neighbor called the police to complain about Berghardt leaving her stereo on for three days and three nights, police discovered her body. She was sexually assaulted and brutally murdered. Police noted that her bedroom screen window was also missing. Police then frantically searched for that killer, not knowing that they were already holding him in custody for completely unrelated charges. Harvey then slipped under the radar and was back on the streets to commit more carnage in no time. His next victim was Charlotte Schmoyer, a newspaper carrier. June 9, 1993, people began scanning the streets when they woke up and didn't find newspapers on their doorsteps. One client, however, found Charlotte's paper cart abandoned next to her bike. Soon enough, residents called the police, who concluded that she was abducted. The resulting search party didn't take long to find blood, a shoe, and finally the battered body of Schmoyer stuffed under a stack of logs. An autopsy said that she was stabbed at least 22 times and also sexually assaulted repeatedly. Harvey Robinson's gruesome teenage murder streak didn't end there. July 1993. He found his third victim, Jessica Jean Fortney. In similar form, he would sexually assault before strangling her to death. Robinson had one other known victim. After stalking her mother for days, he broke into the girl's home, where he assaulted and choked her. Luckily, she survived. His fourth victim, however, would finally lead to his capture. Denise Sam Callie escaped his attack and agreed to allow the police to use her as bait. When Harvey returned to her home several nights later to presumably finish off the job, 
An officer was there to meet him. The officer shot at him, but Robinson managed to flee the scene by crashing through a glass window. After the shootout, they apprehended Harvey at a local hospital, where he had gone to seek treatment for his wounds. While courts often give juvenile defenders much more lenient sentences due to their age, the grisly nature, repetition, and speed of these crimes sparked enough outrage to lead Robinson to three consecutive death sentences and more than a hundred years in prison. And number one, Craig Price. July 27, 1987, Craig Price committed his first murder at the age of 13. But it wasn't the end. He would go on to kill three more people, becoming the youngest serial killer in U.S. history. According to many, Price actually had a happy childhood. All of his teachers and neighbors liked him. As a child, he went the extra mile to help others. But when Price was nine, things began to change for him. Price started experiencing disturbingly dark thoughts about death and murder. And by the time he turned 13, he began using drugs. And not only that, but would also have a criminal record including breaking and entering, robbery, and assault. July 27, 1987, one of the nights he was out roaming around the neighborhood, lurking in the shadows, he would find himself outside of a neighbor's house, Rebecca Spencer. But instead of just robbing her, his psychopathic urge drove him to take a knife from the kitchen and stab her 58 times. After brutally taking out Rebecca, Price didn't kill anyone else. He cooled off for a little over two years. However, as with most serial killers, Price's urge to kill would return, and he just knew that he would have to find another victim. September 1st, 1989, at 15, Craig would kill three other neighbors. Price, high on marijuana and LSD, stabbed Joan Heaton 57 times. He also stabbed her daughter Jennifer 62 times and crushed the skull of her other daughter Melissa before stabbing her 30 times. The slashings were so similar to his first known kill that the FBI was called in to profile this serial killer. However, initially they failed to identify a 15-year-old as their suspect. But one day, as a couple of officers were patrolling the area, they came across Price hanging out with some friends at the local park. The cops knew about his previous run-ins with authorities, so they decided to ask him if he'd heard anything about what had happened in the neighborhood. That's when they noticed that one of his hands was bandaged, so they asked him what happened. Price didn't hesitate to tell him that he had drunkenly punched out a car window. The officers decided to check his story, but they couldn't find any reports from the night Price said he punched out that window. With a lack of information to corroborate Price's claims, it was clear to him that he had been less than truthful about how he injured himself. The investigators would grow suspicious. Nonetheless, there wasn't any concrete evidence against him. But as luck would have it, one of Price's friends called him a short while later to tell him how Price had been bragging about the murders and getting away with it. That was the information they needed to issue the proper arrest warrant. Price calmly confessed to his crimes as he was tried and convicted as a minor. By law, this meant that he would be released and his criminal record sealed when he turned 21, and Price bragged that he would make history when he was released. However, Price was not released due to a series of crimes he committed behind bars, including criminal contempt for refusing a psychological evaluation, extortion for threatening a corrections officer, assault, and violation of probation for fights while in prison. He was sentenced to an additional 10 to 25 years, depending on his cooperation with treatment.